everyone. I'm Shaheen from The Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here with Alison Tyrrell, Global Head of Content, Brand Marketing, and Media at Spark Foundry, which is one of five global media agency brands within Publicist Media, and they specialize in media strategy across global markets. So thanks so much for joining us, Alison. Thank you for inviting me. This is exciting. Yeah, so um, your agency has won numerous awards for content marketing in particular. Could you uh, share with us a bit about well, your approach to content marketing and maybe an example of something you've done that's uh, been recognized and that you're especially proud of? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we have been lucky enough to win quite a few awards for our clients. Um, and they can sometimes be something that's you know as small as a UX design that we've done or something bigger, such as a content marketing strategy um, and how we've tried to create innovative content to be distinctive for the brand. I think the most uh, proud that I am of a a campaign that we've won awards for was uh, one that we did for a client called UBS, who's one of the world's largest wealth managers. um, And they've got a really innovative marketing team. So they allow us to do some pretty cool stuff. And um, a few years ago, they wanted us to talk about a long-term investment theme, which is artificial intelligence, and to marry that with um, a famous economist, uh, Herbert A. Simon, who won an economic award in Nobel. He's a Nobel laureate. Um, so we needed to find a way of contemporizing this theme, right? How do we make this interesting to the general public? Like, why would they care about artificial intelligence when everybody's talking about it? And how do we make them care about, uh, you know, a Nobel laureate. So we created this really, really cool piece of content with the New York Times. And the way that we thought of doing it was to embed AI into the content and you could talk to the AI. Like it wasn't a chatbot. This was legit AI. So you could talk to it about anything, but every now and again, it would prompt you to uh, learn a little bit more about how artificial intelligence has grown from the time that Herbie Simon did his study to where we are today. And um, so we created a little film that uh, was featured a professor, Professor Ishiguru. And um, he was talking about how he is trying to now embed human emotions into robots, which is pretty terrifying. Um, but it was, it was interesting for us to actually teach you about the content through the content, like we're we're teaching you about artificial intelligence with artificial intelligence. Um, And obviously that came with risk. It took a hell of a lot of courage for UBS to take that leap because you can't control what that's going to say. And so it came with many disclaimers, um, but that's probably the one that I'm most proud of. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. And so that's, um, um, so you're kind of in the business of creativity. I wanted to ask you, what, what is your creative process? How do you guys come up, come up with these crazy ideas and in order to implement them? <laughs> sure. Um, I think it starts predominantly with data. So we don't kind of just finger to the wind. We really need to understand what's our objective. So, uh, we look, we do a lot of data analysis, understanding the audience, their passion points. What are the crossovers between what the brand wants to be known as, uh, to what the audience actually care about. Where are the audience? How are they consuming content? Are they predominantly in print? Are they predominantly TV? Are they pre- so we do a lot of analysis. And once we've decided that, we figure out our objective. What is the thing that we're trying to achieve and how do we want to measure it? Um, and quite often we partner with publications because that's where content is, right? So people don't generally want to go to a brand website to learn more. They will go to where they usually go and read content. So we want to be there. Um, And the ideas come from a combination of the client, so the brand, because they know their brand best, a little bit of us driving it from a data perspective, and and a lot um, is driven by the publisher, because the publisher is what they do on a day-to-day basis. You know, they create content. So um, it's a marriage between the three, I think, from an ideas perspective. Mm -hmm. I see. And and so your role is head of content, brand marketing, and media. Can you explain a bit more what that means and what your day-to-day is like? Sure. Um, so yeah, I sit within Spark Foundry uh, looking after content. So I'd work with our clients and basically plug our clients into the capabilities of the entire company. So Spark Foundry is a agency within publicist media and publicist media is huge. So When a client decides to work with us for content, they're not just working with us. They are working with the entire network. So if we need to work with people from Digitas, Starcom, we will do. Um, And that's kind of what I have the capability of helping them with. 
but my team do everything end to end. So we do the data analysis. We help a brand create what their brand communications are going to be. We build the strategy and media. We do the planning, uh, the media buying, and then we do the activation. So end to end, setting up the campaign, optimizing it throughout. And the optimizations could be basic media optimizations to UX, you know, if, if we're seeing that people are going through the content and they're stopping at a certain time, do we need to change an element of it? Do we need to change the experience on mobile so that you can do it within the area of your thumb? Uh, do we need to um, change the creative? Like, are people responding more to red than they are green? So we do all of that um, right down to the reporting at the very end. So everything. <laughs> <laughs> And in your role is global, so that means you work with markets around the world. How do you make your content resonate in different geographies? Yeah, it's a good question. And and to be honest, it, it often comes down to what the objective of the brand is, right? So if it's a brand awareness piece, sometimes it's a simple uh, one size fits all. But if we're getting more down into performance and targeted or sh- short term uh, campaigns, it's going to be more about localization. So we have teams globally and quite often we will leverage their expertise because they're going to know their region a hell of a lot better than I will. So, uh, for example, we've worked quite a lot with our team in Hong Kong and they will help us make recommendations as to best media, uh, you know, best communication. Sometimes it's a language thing and I don't mean um, like speaking different languages. I mean, it can be quite literally a different word even in an English language that people would respond to. So it's understanding like consumer and audience behavior in different regions. So from that perspective, we definitely rely on on the ground teams for that. Um, and we work collaboratively with them so that again, we're not finger to the winding, you know, any of our ideas. They are based on facts. Mm-hmm. So do you have offices in, in all the different markets? Yeah. We okay. do, yeah. Yeah. We're a global company. So we're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So and so you're kind of coordinating with people in in those offices all the time. But are they actually on your team or yeah, yeah, well they they would be they would work in their own teams and then like I was saying we can um bring in like the power of the entire company into mm-hmm. any project that we have for a client. But generally quite honestly, a lot of it from a global perspective is managed via us. It would be if there was a localized opportunity, we will reach out to our local teams as they are the experts in that region. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, So do you have an example of like a really like international project that you've done or something that was in a a faraway market? I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. um, Yeah, we've done a few. So uh, a few years ago, we did a massive one where we tried to create an ecosystem, right? So we were talking to more than one audience type. So we needed different publications to suit the different audience types. So one was a, a broader level awareness piece on what the topic was underneath that we had subject experts so you know we don't want to dumb down our topic so we're talking more in depth we need to find the right publication for that Um, and then we had to do that globally so that came down to truly translating differently Um, we had toggles on our content so depending on what region you are you could quite easily change the language of the entire article the entire video different captions will come up Um, And also something that we're very conscious of uh, in any global campaign that we do, we need to be very careful how we're doing it. So what I mean there is um, we have done, again, for UBS, some really cool pieces of content on the opportunities investing in China. But China are are naturally going to be a target market to read that content, too. So you don't want to alienate the country by going, oh, you know, we're, we're reading about ourselves in a third person. It needs to be quite natural so that even they find it interesting. So there, there's quite a few different hurdles to overcome with a global uh, campaign such as that. But yeah, the, the example that I gave there about using multiple publications to, to kind of overcome those was a good example. Um, so I wanted to go to your personal story. So how did you first break into marketing and what attracted you to the profession in the first place? Uh, I fell into it completely by accident. So um, about 15 years ago, I'd created a blog um, about art and fashion, specifically tattoo art, actually. 
And um, I was writing blogs. Um, this is around the time that Chanel and Louis Vuitton had tattooed uh, models on the runway. Um, but interviews with uh, quite famous tattoo artists or influencers in their own right within the tattoo industry. And um, I worked with some of my friends who are photographers and they travel. So I was getting them to meet up with these people in America, uh, the UK and Ireland and do photo shoots. So everything was quite professionally done. It was all basically just purely on hobby. I was making no money out of it. And this is when content marketing was as easy as just stuffing something with keywords. Um, But that did quite Well, and based on that, I got asked to help a few companies with their digital presence. And again, this is 15 years ago. So um, I did that for a while. I freelanced um, and helped a few companies. And then based on that, I started working with Mondelez International. And that's when it became more of a corporate job. So I learned a lot about um, corporate affairs and PR. Obviously, then I went to study that. and then, yeah, it then just grew from there. And then I'm where I am today. So I kind of fell into it. It was completely by accident. It was um, a nice surprise. <laughs> cool. So, I mean, it sounds like you're a natural at it. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't but it, say that. But, yeah, it, <laughs> but it came out of personal interest. Of yeah. Exactly. It came out of, it came, it, I think it's a creative, it's the best of a creative bunch. If you're going to work, work corporately, I, I get the opportunity to be creative. So it suits me, I guess. Yeah. Um, and that kind of what you were saying before you were working in, in corporates before you came to Spark Foundry, which is about five years ago. So I was curious yeah. kind of, um, how you compare the experience, like what's it work, what's it like working in a, for a large brand or corporation compared to working in an agency? Yeah. Um, completely different. So, I mean, there's, there's elements that I miss about working brand side. When you're working brand side, you truly understand the brand that you're selling you live and breathe it every day everybody around you is living and breathing it um but I guess what I've learned and gained agency side is a hell of a lot more knowledge on what goes on in the background and I think having the combination of the two really helps right because when I was brand side I knew what the strategic blue sky vision was that we wanted for the brand and then you try and execute and you trust your agency team to deliver the detail right so you trust what they say but you never truly understood what it meant not not really because you weren't managing it but now I'm on the flip side of that so yeah it's it's much harder slog but from an experience and growth point of view you learn a hell of a lot more agency side and a hell of a lot faster and um, but in regards to the similarities, I think, you know, you're still dealing with the same stuff. There's a lot of red tape. The bigger the company that you're working for, the more internal red tape you have. So whilst I'm agency side and we don't have the red tape, we still experience it on behalf of our clients, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so you still got the same hurdles. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um and then, so you also have this experience uh, working abroad in Australia. I was curious how that compared working in marketing there compared to working in Ireland and the UK where, where you are now I guess you're in between Ireland and the UK <laughs> yeah. um, do you know what? it's interesting when I was in Australia um we used to always in Australian marketing we used to always look to London and be like the UK are killing it they know exactly what to do it's brilliant so when I moved to London I felt like I was falling into the epicenter of like marketing but then in London, we were looking back to Australia going, oh, my God, Australia, they're, they're innovative, they're doing things way ahead of us. So it, it, the grass is always greener. But if in truth, um, I do think you know Australia are leading the way. They're always about four or five years ahead. Like when we were in Australia, we were talking about audio marketing and we were setting up uh, podcasts for clients. But that was now maybe seven or eight years ago. I've got clients now who I'm still trying to convince to do audio marketing in London. So, you know, I think Australia, they truly are ahead of the curve. They really are. Very cool. Um, and then I wanted to ask what, what advice would you have for, for anyone who, who wants to get their foot in the door at a, at a large agency like Publicis? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Publicis in particular actually have a really good graduate program. And they also have a a lot of entry level opportunities. So 
the easiest, the low-hanging fruit for anybody trying to enter the industry as a career, I would highly advise reaching out to um, the recruitment, which you can easily find that by Googling it, uh, the HR group basically within Publicist Media, because what they do is store your CV and as soon as the next program comes available, you get the opportunity to partake. And what that program involves quite often is experiencing many of the different teams. So it could be sitting within my team in content. It could be media only. It might be biddable media. It could be production only. Basically, you get to experience the entire company and then decide which one you like best. So I think that that's probably the best way in. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what skills do you think are most important nowadays for, for I, working in it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I... um this is another interesting one. I, when I'm hiring for my team, I care more about experience than I do, uh, degrees. That's just me. Um, if they were to do education, then for me, uh, communications and or psychology have been the strongest things to study if you want to go into marketing. Because at the end of the day, what we do, it's not, It it doesn't take a genius, but what it does take is like an empathy to understand human behavior, right? Human psychology. Um, So if you've got that as an underpinning, if it's an interest of yours even, then I think that that's that's definitely something to come forward with. That's something that I would look for. Are people interested in in the psychology of the way we think? And if so, then that's definitely a good foundation to join the team. (laughs) Yeah, and actually a, a question that comes up in our community a lot is like how to get that experience um, if you don't have it. And actually your example of how you got started is interesting because it was based on on a project that, you, you know, personal of personal interest, right? So I guess that's yeah, the answer. <laughs> exactly. That and just like reading books. If, if it's a genuine interest of yours, then you're probably reading or listening to podcasts or you're learning about it enough to have an opinion. An opinion is good, you know, and there's so much content out there. All you have to do is Google um, marketing tips, strategies, TED Talks, and there's so much inspiration out there um, to gather what element of marketing that you're interested in. So that's a good segue into talking about your recommendations. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So yeah, what's a source of professional inspiration for you? Uh, Okay. So I mean, I listen a lot to uh, podcasts. I listen a lot to audio books. Again, I probably do watch a few YouTube, um, videos to kind of hear what other companies are doing, what other campaigns are doing, get inspiration from them. Um, book wise, I highly recommend the Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, I read that a few years ago now and truly it, it, it did change the way that I approach marketing campaigns and it still does. Um, I love the way that they are getting you to change the perspective of how you're looking at doing things because I, w- without giving too much about the book away, because I do highly recommend that your, uh, viewers do read it, but it gives you a good, uh, approach to how you differentiate what you're doing from your competitors and Quite often, success is only a one degree shift to the right or the left. It doesn't need something massively different. And um, so the book really, really helps you identify what that is. Um, other things that I would listen to uh, would be Masters of Scale or How We Built It. So basically, entrepreneur podcasts. And the reason I listen to them, again, I, I find that there's so much to learn from a successful business, a successful entrepreneur, because they are truly the masters of finding opportunity and challenge. And as a marketer, that's what you do every day. Right? You're trying to understand who the audience are, and you're trying to understand how to overcome the challenges that you have to reach them in a, in a valuable way. So gaining inspiration from them um, is highly valuable as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I really like the Masters of Scale podcast as well. Reed Hoffman, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's really good. Um, and then any favorite app that you would recommend or that you use? Um, yeah, I think uh, probably Audible right now. Audible I'm using a lot, uh, both just for personal reading um, and, and also for uh, business and to stay on top of things. Um, but it's just, it gives you the freedom to kind of go, you know, during your lunch break and go for a walk around the block because we're all in lockdown and you can listen to something that just takes your mind out into the possibilities, you know? So, 
Uh, Audible is definitely, po- I'd say, my most used app at the moment. Um, so we're reaching the, the end of the interview. So I just wanted to ask if you have any parting advice for other content marketers in Europe. Uh, my advice would be to read books on human behavior. Um, so How Brands Grow, Byron Sharp is like a key Bible. Um, uh, there's an, more books on behavioral economics. Look them up because it's super simple. It's basic. Nothing's changed in the history of marketing. And it always comes down to the fundamentals. And I think that we get really, really lost in the cost per clicks. And whilst they're important, there's a much bigger picture to marketing. Um, and I would highly recommend just getting your head stuck into understanding human behaviors um, and the fundamentals of it. That would be yeah. my advice. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a very, very good point um, and a great note to end on. So thank you so much, Alison, for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for listening in. For more perspectives on the content marketing industry in Europe, check out thecontentmix.com and keep tuning into the podcast for daily interviews with content experts. See you next time. Bye-bye.